Thank you very much indeed, Gerd. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here. This is my first face-to-face -face meeting here at ESC since COVID-19, and I have to say it's great to be back in person, and great to see all friends as well. So uh, these are my disclosures. So we know that we have some very, very uh, good guidelines on the management of atrial fibrillation. Uh, our esteemed chairperson today was heavily involved in, in these guidelines uh, that were last updated in 2020, and they provide very, a solid framework for which we uh, use to, to guide management of our patients with atrial fibrillation. We know that the global prevalence, the incidence are rising, uh, patients are getting older, AF is the commonest arrhythmia, uh, and as the population ages, the risk factor burden increases. We'll, I'll touch a little bit on that. The, the, we're going to see more and more patients with AF. And something that was quite startling was that uh, uh, when, you, when you find out that if you're in a room with three people who are 50 or more, and I'm over 50, there is a one in three chance that one of those people will get AF in their lifetime. And that's quite significant when you think about it. Now, why is it important? You, you've heard from uh, the speakers before, uh, there are some very negative outcomes that are associated with atrial fibrillation, increased risk uh, of uh, linked to death, increased risk of stroke, of course, that we're all aware about. The strokes are often denser, more severe, more life-changing, and more life-threatening. Links with LV systolic dysfunction and heart failure, recurrent hospitalizations, which then directly impact quality of life. Increasing recognition now, as you've also heard, with cognitive decline and dementia, and uh, of course depression. And people get symptoms, but there are a significant number of people who don't have symptoms, they're completely symptom free. And actually in that instance, somebody could be having atrial fibrillation, be at risk of all these negative effects, and not even realize that they, that they are at risk. So how do we detect AF? And again, the guidelines are, are very comprehensive and they, and they tell us that we need a standard 12 EDCG. Uh, or we have a single channel tracing of 30 seconds or more uh, that uh, is diagnostic of atrial fibrillation. In people that are screen positive, uh, where uh, there is either an ECG, a 12 ECG, or a single channel recording more than 30 seconds that, that is confirmed uh, by a physician. So ECG really is the key to, to making the diagnosis. We know that there are different types of ECGs. Of course, the 12 lead ECGs is, is the best, the ideal. We won't, not everyone has access to that, and certainly not in a home situation. There are increasingly devices that are available that will give either a single channel and now also a six channel, which, uh, which we'll briefly touch on. So there are a number of tools that can be used in screening of atrial fibrillation as well. Again, this is pulled straight from the guidance. Uh, again, the guidelines give us an indication about opportunistic versus systematic screening. Uh, people over 65 uh, advocation for, for performing opportunistic screening, but those who are over 75 where we know the risk is higher, having a more systematic approach to screening. And again, highlighting once again that to make a definitive diagnosis of AF in screen positive cases, it's established after a physician reviews the single channel ECG recording that shows AF for 30 seconds or more, uh, or a 12 lead ECG that confirms the presence of atrial fibrillation. Now, risk factors, of course, are very, very important, and there are certain risk factors that we can't really do much about. Uh, aging, we're all on that journey, we're all getting older, uh, we can't do anything about that. Genetics, ethnicity, gender. However, there are a whole load of risk factors that we can do something about. Uh, and again, the guidelines are, are, are very clear in terms of identifying these and managing them. Hypertension, you've been hearing about, of course, very, very important. But there are others, diabetes, uh, physical inactivity, uh, obesity, which is a huge problem, uh, certainly um, in, in the UK where I work. Sleep apnea increasingly now being recognized as well. Smoking, excess alcohol intake, hyperlipidemia. So these are all factors that are very, very important. Uh, and this is also highlighted in the ESC guidelines. Uh, and also, interestingly, in the AHA guidelines. And it, in fact, lifestyle and risk factor modification is now a pillar um, in the, in the uh, latest AHA guidelines as well. Now, the European Heart Rhythm Association have produced some guidelines about digital devices and managing and detecting arrhythmias, uh, a very comprehensive uh, a document. And again, highlighting there are different types of devices that are available to us now. You've heard about the Omron Complete, and I'll talk a little bit about that shortly as well. We have devices that are handheld or are wearable, devices that are looking only at the pulse, so plethysmography-based, or that actually look at the ECG. 
Uh, and of course, that's needed in order to diagnose atrial fibrillation. Uh, and we now have access to one lead, but also 12, uh, six lead um, devices, six, six limb leads that can be seen on, on handheld devices as well. So the guidelines highlight the importance of having ECG correlating with symptoms. Uh, for paroxysmal arrhythmias, these devices can be very, very useful and can be utilized in order to establish diagnosis. This is a flowchart, again, pulled straight from the guidelines uh, about screening. Patients with prior stroke, again, we know that they are at higher risk uh, and they should have more systematic screening. Those that, um, that haven't had a stroke, again, depending on their age, uh, this flowchart nicely highlights the importance of comorbidities. Some of these, of course, we're all familiar with, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, but CKD, chronic kidney disease, COPD, increasingly recognized, and sleep apnea as well. And again, a nice sort of flow chart that helps us guide us in terms of using these wearable uh, and handheld devices for detecting atrial fibrillation and the importance of it. We've been hearing about hypertension and atrial fibrillation and the com combination. We know a billion people worldwide are affected by hypertension. We know that the combination of AF and hypertension is, is very dangerous. That combination almost doubles the risk of stroke. Uh, and stroke prevention, of course, is a, is a top priority everywhere. As Professor Hendricks indicated, a stroke has huge financial implications for healthcare providers worldwide, not to mention the individual affected in terms of their day-to-day -day existence. So detecting these things is very, very important. The Omron Complete device that you've just heard about is a two-in-one blood pressure and single-channel ECG recording. Um, it requires a smartphone uh, and downloading of a, a Connect Omron app onto the smartphone and uses the Alive Core technology to record a single channel ECG recording. And in Coventry, we wanted to do a little study just to have a look and see how patients and public volunteers would respond to this device. So we carried out this small study um, looking at uh, patients who were attending an EP clinic, uh, 15 patients. They were given the device, shown how to use it, given two week trial to go away, use the device. We also have a public volunteer group in the hospital. So these are members of the public who are interested in helping out with the research. And we had 11 public volunteers who, uh, who were given sort of the device to look at in an interactive workshop and also a focus group. We collected uh, data using questionnaires from them and they all had uh, semi-structured interviews by phone or in person. Uh, and uh, we used um, uh, thematic analysis to try and look at some qualitative data that was uh, obtained. So the, some, of the, some of the brief highlights of the study, the cohort was uh, around about 60 years of age, both, both groups, quite a wide age range, so as young as 20, as old as 82, a fairly even split of males and females in both groups, and the overall themes that emerged from, uh, from the thematic analysis was that the Omron device was very positively re uh, received by both groups. Uh, both groups felt that it empowered patients, so patients were now given the responsibility of recording their blood pressure, which they were, a lot of them were very used to, but actually also recording their rhythm. They felt that the basic level of technical skill was important, um, so these patients and public volunteers were shown how to use the device, and that was felt to be very important, but if that wasn't present, that actually that would be needed to help them. Uh, I quite like the little video that was shown by Professor Sanu showing the device literally how it's used in 30 seconds. Users were very eager to learn about ECGs um, and again there was the, the feeling that actually if there were tracings there needs to be support in place because very often there is confusion about what the tracing might show but that there was clear potential to integrate these sorts of, uh, of, of technologies into, into clinical care. The two other points also that came up, interestingly, one, one patient, elderly patient, didn't have a smartphone, so couldn't use the device, um, and uh, uh, another patient had severe arthritis, so wasn't able to fully hold the device, uh, given the size of the device. Now, electrophysiologists such as myself, we love doing AF ablation, but again, the important thing is detecting the AF early, intervening early, and actually that has been shown to make a difference in terms of outcome. Uh, and so it's not just about ablating, it's about getting in there early and making sure you detect AF early, no matter what technology that you're using. This is again another lovely slide from the SE guidelines talking about integrated management, being patient-centric, making sure we optimize stroke risk and symptom control, and then all of the other things beneath that, lifestyle modification, psychological support, patient education and support, and again, detecting AF and making sure that we give a good framework for, for patients and having a very MDT-type approach. And this is my last slide. 
Again, having the patient right at the middle, a number of healthcare professionals that may be looking after the patient and advocating the CC to ABC approach. So confirm the AF, of course, which is very important, to characterize it and then to use the ABC approach to avoid strokes and anticoagulation, better symptom control, and importantly, address risk factors and comorbidities. And I think I'll end there. Thank you very much indeed.